And uh, on today's card, we have steak racing galore, but not every race is a stakes race. We have a lot of overnight raceway horses uh, racing in events, sort of our meat and potatoes on the card. One of them is Richie Let's Go. He's in today's second race, and uh, I was looking at the race. Looks like a speed duel. Yeah, there's certainly uh, certainly plenty of speed in the race. Uh, every horse in the race can uh, report down there in 26 if need be, and it's one of those races where everybody's going to want good position, and it, it could be pretty interesting in the first turn. Well, you say pretty interesting, but ultimately where Richie Let's Go lands will not be in your hands. It's Brian Sears is at the helm. Do you take the opportunity to say, hey, Brian, it looks like this race has a lot of speed inside of him. Perhaps this is an opportunity for Richie Let's Go to race differently? Well, we, uh, we discussed a little bit, and, uh, you know, we kind of asked what I wanted him to do. I said, well, you're the one holding the lines. I mean, ultimately, that decision has to be the driver's. I don't think it's wise to go out there with only one thought in your mind. You, to a certain extent, you always have to wait and see what happens when the gate springs. All right, so a game plan is okay, but you must be flexible. Absolutely. Richie Let's Go was third last time out here at the Meadows. He was only beaten a half a length, so he was right there with him. Sometimes when we look at a charted line, we don't see all the activity. Was he blocked? Did he have any excuse? What was the effort like? Yeah, he, uh, he raced real good last week. He left out of there, let I, Carl go, and then uh, Yo 11 Low went to the front, and, and he ended up uh, stopping, and we kind of got shuffled back all the way to the last, and he, he came charging home on the end of it and, and really just, just missed. So coming into this one, are you well pleased with his current form? Absolutely. I think he's uh, right on top of his game. All right. Let's move ahead then to the sixth race. This is a condition event. All ages now. Winners of 4,400 last five starts. Golden Tommy gets the rail, plus he moves out of the open class. Are those two reasons to like him a lot today, Kent? I think so. Uh, this horse has been racing uh, pretty good. Uh, maybe not top of his game, but pretty good and just has been in some bad spots. And I think he should like this group a little better. All right, this brings us up then to the eighth race, and boy, you've got a lot of blanks to fill in here. We see a horse by the name of Soccer Mania, a four-year-old gelding by goalie Jeff. I would go out on a limb and say this might be his first appearance in your, in your barn. Yes, we just bought him at the uh, Meadowlands sale uh, after the Hamiltonian, so we uh, haven't had a lot of time to work with him, but we thought we'd uh, throw him in today for the big day and <coughs> kind of give him a test run, see what we think. All right, tell me a little bit about how a trainer looks at that first outing. Obviously, you want to be competitive, but what is it you really want from Soccer Mania today, and what do you want for yourself when you come back to the barn today? What do you want to have happened, and uh, what are you going to be looking at when he's out on the track? Well, I want to see how he goes with the way he's rigged. I've basically just rigged him the same way that he was uh, when we bought the horse. I want to see uh, how I think he goes uh, with that rigging, if I want to make any changes, and and uh, kind of see how the horse's attitude is, if he wants to leave or come from behind, and, and you know what type of style of race he's really going to like. What made you think that Soccer Mania was a good purchase? What drew you to this particular horse? Well, for one thing, I think he's a young horse, and uh, you know he shows some pretty high speed. Shows while not winning, he, he shows pacing in 51 and a piece, and and with good clothes on 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 the end of just about all of his miles, and. Uh, uh, I think any horse coming from the Meadowlands, most generally, uh, if they're racing in medium level conditions, which he was, uh, sh usually gets some class relief by coming to the Meadows. So those horses are usually pretty successful. So it's a horse with a course in mind. You knew you'd be bringing him here, and you thought he would be getting somewhat class relief. You know, we always hear what you just mentioned, speed, speed, speed. Is that the only element of our game anymore? Well, it's, it's tough to get away from it. Uh, it. You know, if you don't have it, it just it, it makes you so much a victim of what, what happens in the race. And if you have it, you can, you can kind of make your own luck a little bit. So it, it's very important. Our first one's coming up. Let's send it over for the call to none other than Roger Houston. Thank you. Earlier today, I promised that I would be talking to the likes of Hall of Famers. Well, sometimes things just fall in place, and the right person is there at the right time. Joining me now is Gene Regal. His stable has market report in this upcoming race. And Gene, you've gone to post a lot of times with post-time favorites. You have another one here in market report. However, the bad news is, the last time he was here at the Meadows, things didn't work out so well. Yeah, uh, I wasn't here that night. They said he either jumped a scalper or a bell boot in the last curve coming off the curve. Well, he certainly had an awesome lead on him. I think it was something like four or five lengths strong. I did see the race, and he just darted to the outside, it seemed. When a horse sees something, gets spooked like that, uh, obviously you wonder whether you've uh, touched on the right thing. Did you have to add any equipment after that? Uh, no, we didn't do anything uh, any different. And uh, he came come off of a big win last week, so he was really good last week. 
Actually, he comes off a few big wins. I think something like three strong now. Do you think he can make it four straight here? Well, he could. <laughs> he could. Everything is possible in racing. That's right. Let's talk about the third race uh, briefly. Rain Dance Hanover, a horse that's uh, been freshened. Is that a good sign for this colt? I think he's a little outclassed in this uh, race here. I think he'll need this race. Uh, if he gets a check, I'd be tickled to death. There's always that question of tightness. In the fifth race, we're talking to David L. Lawrence, two-year-old Colt Stakes, and you have a pair, I believe, of Arts Places racing today, a horse that certainly provided you with the biggest thrill of your career, maybe, that 152-2 and two win at Scioto Downs, at least the swiftest mile of your driving career. That's right, it did. You know, I think up until then I had a, a win a record, I think, of 56-4, and four, something like that. Well, I, did you think you were going that much faster? Yeah, a little. Well, I know you have such fond feelings for Art's Place, and you have a number of his Colts in training. How do you feel about them overall? Well, I think he started off with a terrific year, and uh, I look for him to just keep getting better. As a stallion... Uh He'll put a lot of stamina in these uh, colts when they get older, just like the uh, line of amber crumbies. And, uh, and I think he showed so far of his group of two-year-olds uh, so much more than amber crumbie ever did. Well, you talk stamina, but today, Gene, all I hear is speed. Stamina not important anymore. Uh, it still is. you got to have the speed, but you got to have the stamina, too. All right, Art Attack. He had a stake race last time out up at the Meadowlands. He went off at 40 to 1. Obviously, the crowd was saying he was in over his head. Yeah, he's still in over his head today, too. He's a big, growthy colt and just hasn't come into himself yet. All right, in the seventh race, then, Art and Soul, the other Art's place. Uh, he also has been racing very limited, just four starts, but at least he does have a victory there over at Scioto Downs. Yeah, this colt here, uh, he's a little more quicker and a little more uh, competitive than what Art Attack is. But he has that eight hole. Do you think that that is going to determine his fate today? Well, it ain't going to help him any, maybe. <laughs> and speaking of eight holes, you have another one with an Abercrombie Colt, Personal Power. Now, he's only had two starts, and he's in that process of learning. Isn't this a tough way to get those lessons? Uh, yes, it is. You know, he's a, that occurs you're going back to Abercrombie again. I think he'll get better with every race. That brings us up to the 13th race, a no-nukes colt by the name of Friendship Hanover. He's one of those horses that made one of those mistakes early on, last time out. Probably didn't get off the gate very far before he made a break. Do you uh, know what was that about? Uh, I think he, the boy had to grab a hold of the colt. He's shaking his head a little, and I think that's the reason the colt made a break his last start. But I give him a little shot today. All right, so you're not too concerned. You think that's just a one-time thing? I hope. I hope. Well, I hope for your sake, too. And thank you, Gene, for stopping by. Always a pleasure to see you. Good luck today. Okay, thank you. Back over to you, Roger. Joining me now is top catch rainsman Luke Willette. He's handling nervous in today's fourth race invitational pace, but perhaps I'm the one that should be a little bit nervous. Luke was just featured as Bachelor of the Month in the most recent Cosmopolitan magazine. And Luke, aside from the serious business of racing, there's been a lot of lighthearted chatter about you showing up in that magazine. Well, uh, <laughs> I must say it was not any of my doing because I'm not exactly a bachelor. But uh, it was a joke from a friend of mine who she sent a picture in and everything, so we are having some fun with it. Well, you get lots of attention on the track, and I'm sure now you get a lot of attention off the track. But you do have a tough assignment today in the fourth race invitational. This horse, Nervous, uh, has raced here at the Meadows before. He comes in off some efforts on half-mile tracks. You're considered a half-mile track specialist, but what's your get on this horse today? Well, uh, I think he's in against a tough field of horses, but... Uh, been racing pretty well there. Uh, I think he, he's going to be all right. I, As for you, what about the opportunity of getting in the groove before you have to go postward in your elimination division of the Adios today? Is it important to get out there at least once and get a feel of that track? Oh, I don't think so, but I don't mind being on a racetrack. That's how I earn a living. You'd rather be active than sitting on the sidelines? Yes, definitely. Today they've been talking a lot about weight, and uh, they have you weighing it at 142 pounds. How important do you see weight as a factor, and do you work at keeping yourself trim? Well, uh, yeah, I do watch what I eat, and uh, I think it's important for a driver because uh, I know when I get over, like, 150, uh, I don't feel as athletic in a race bike, and I'm not as comfortable, and uh, I think it's a factor. 
All right, so you yourself think it's a factor. We're going to see how it factors into today's 10th race, the Adios Elimination Division, the second one. You have the uh, assignment behind hair, hair. And earlier today, they also said that they thought your aggressive driving style should pair up well with this horse. Well, I've driven him a few times before, and uh, he's a pretty nice race horse. And uh, I think he got in the tougher division here, but I think he fits in pretty well. He did draw the tougher division, no doubt about that. We have to give credit where credit is due. What makes Hare Hare a possible in this, even though he's listed at 8 to 1 in the morning line? Well, he's a pretty nice horse. He's sharp right now. He put in a big performance last week at the Mill and out of 10 all. And um, I think he suits this field just fine here. He's got the 4 all and uh, he's been racing very well. He's got 172,000 made this year. They didn't give it to him. He's earned it, so. So what about your options in this particular race? You know this competition very well. Where do you see yourself getting away initially, and well, how do you think the race might unfold? Uh, I think we're going to decide that when the gate opens. Well, I know that, Luke. I was trying to just get some information ahead of time. We always have to wait and see what happens. And, you know, I hear that from drivers over and over and over again. Yet they tell me they study the program. Certainly you must have some what of an idea before you go to post. Yeah, I do. Uh, this type of horse, he races pretty well near the front there, so that's where we would like to be, so we'll see. Luke, what about conditions that you have to take into consideration, such as maybe they're talking about that light breeze blowing, uh, whether the front end, if there's a track bias today, things like that. What do you look at before you go to the post? Well, the track seems very fast here today, and uh, the breeze is very light, so I don't think that's going to be a factor too, too much. All right, well, pretty soon we're going to see you in action in today's fourth race. Get out there and get going, and good luck. Thank you. Back over to you, Roger. With me now is trainer Virgil Morgan. Of course, we're looking ahead to today's fifth race. That is the first division of two-year-old Colt Pace action in the Arden Downstake, David L. Lawrence. And uh, Virgil, we have you here all winter long, uh, largely racing overnight horses. In the situation where you're now handling a stakes uh, competitor, do you find the conditioning of this kind of animal any different? Uh, yeah, a lot different. Uh, he needs a lot more uh, training. Uh, uh, you know, he was at a, an, uh, at a time when he needed an education, uh, learning process. Uh, yeah, a lot different. Gifted Cowboy seems to be living up to his name thus far. He's had only four lifetime appearances, two wins, and two seconds. Would you call him a gifted individual? Yes, he is. He's very talented. Uh, the Western Hanovers are doing just great this year, and he's out of a real nice mare in Alberta. He's a homebred, uh, uh, the owner, Glenn Huber, Glenn and Norma Huber, uh, they raced this horse. Nonetheless, when they're looking at him in the morning line, they're not giving him a whole lot of credence from your corner. What kind of a case would you make for him? Uh, probably post is the reason he's 6-1. to one. Obviously, uh, he shows up every week. He's, he's never really the only disappointing effort he showed at uh, Balmoral. Uh, we thought he was a little better than that, and then he came back and won at Pocono. And in uh, his last start there, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do when they go in 54 flat. Uh, but, uh, you know, John Campbell drive, and uh, I think he's going to have uh, more than a fair shot. Well, there's two points now that you mentioned that I want to bring up. Uh, that started Pocono Downs and Reynolds Stake, where he came back and won. It shows making a break. Obviously, he recovered quickly. Yeah, I'm not. I think that was more of a little miscue. Uh, I think uh, he was shying from a whip. Uh, he was in the two hole, and uh, the whip of uh, the other horse was sort of in his face. And uh, I'm not so sure that shouldn't have an interference break there. Brent Holland had been handling Gifted Cowboy thus far in his career. You talk about John Campbell at the lines today. Obviously, most of Harness Racing's population is going to say, positive driver switch. Are you real pleased to have him in your corner? Oh, most definitely, uh, but I don't know about the driver change. Uh, Brent's an excellent driver, uh, uh, and obviously John Campbell, his name speaks for itself. So I, I don't think I, uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, that, that won't hinder us any at all. Virgil, they talk about these young horses and they say one of the keys is to uh, have them coming on the end of it, that they don't want to ever see them tired on the end of the mile. In his short career, do you think he's ever come out of a race tired? Uh, no, not actually. Actually, uh, at Balmoral, when he, he shows getting beat when he was on the front, uh, he got collared about halfway through the stretch. And uh, uh, actually, uh, if he was going to quit, that would have been the opportune time. And uh, he held on pretty tough. Actually, he was gaining ground at the end there. So he's, he's never really uh, gotten tired, no. Obviously, everybody's looking at safety patrol because they see those fast times. However, do you think there's horses that have more desire than speed and beat maybe faster horses just because they're so competitive and want to win? Yeah, I think also you have to look at the track. Uh, the Meadowlands is extremely fast right now. Uh, you know, the other track, Woodbine, uh, it can get fast at times. So uh, I think you have to put the times in their perspective. 
On today's card, you're in with a cast of Hall of Fame trainers and you know trainers that are tops in the field. What do you see down the road for yourself? Are, are more stakes performers uh, what you want to go for? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, I've got some uh, some nice two and three year olds at home, uh, and uh, that's I, I'd like to have a mixture. I love to race horses, um, mm -hmm. but I like to have like uh, maybe 15 colts and 15, 20 race horses, something like that. Well, you love to race horses. Gifted Cowboy is next up, and what's your gut feeling tell you, Virgil? I think he'll race uh, pretty well. He's always shown uh, a true account of himself, and I think uh, he will this evening, too. That's Virgil Morgan, Jr., talking about Gifted Cowboy in today's fifth race. Good luck, Virgil. Thank you. Back over to you, Roger. Hi, I'm Trish Shout Shepherd, and I'm in the winner's circle with Hervé Fillion, who is here tonight to drive in both divisions of the Cinderella Stake, coming up as your fifth and sixth races. Hervé is an iron man in our sport. At 51, he is the world's winningest driver, having nearly 13,000 victories to his credit. By comparison, when jockey Willie Shoemaker retired, he had ridden just over 8,000 winners. Hervé, you often keep a hectic schedule, driving day and night. Where do you usually race, and on a typical day, how many races might you drive in? Well, like this afternoon, I race at Frio, New Jersey, and I jump on the plane at 5.30 at Newark, and here I am in Maywood. So, uh, in a typical day, though, I race at, uh, in uh, New Jersey, Frio, New Jersey, and back to New York at night, which is Yonkers. I drive about 16 hours, uh, 16 hours a day, an average of 16 hours a day, yeah. I guess that's what keeps you sharp. What does keep you going as a driver? What do you enjoy most about your profession? Winning races. I'm out there, you know, I win a lot of races and uh, I drive, uh, drive a lot of horses. But uh, right now I've been winning one out of five, one out of four some year, but uh, I don't get uh, tired doing it because I just sit behind the horse and let the horse do the work. I just follow him around. <laughs> I don't work that hard. Is it really that easy? I read that you started driving at the tender age of 12 and at the age of 13, you recorded your first win. Can you still recall that first victory? You never forget it. Uh, I raced twice at the fair when I was 12 years old in 1952. And my first win was in 1953 when I was 13 with Guy Gratton at Rigo, Quebec. We used to race on Sunday there. So, you know, you never forget your first win. But uh, you never forget, you know, all the wins, uh, there's a lot of them that's good. A lot more sentimental reason than others like Little Brown Jug beating Albatross mm -hmm. with Nansamon, but uh, they're all sweet. I'm sure they are. You have won many major races, but as a professional, are there any goals that you've set for yourself that you haven't accomplished yet? Well, I want to reach 65 years old first, and I won't be driving until I'm 65, so I feel I got uh, 14 good years, uh, good years of driving horses, but hopefully for nine, you know, uh, nine more left, you know, I hope. Well, so you're obviously not ready to hang up the lines, I get it. Looking ahead to tonight's race, these fifth and sixth races, have you driven either one of these fillies before? No, I will in a few uh, minutes here, but uh, I never did before. But uh, they uh, come from a top uh, stable, Oval Street, and uh, I feel that uh, there's two, uh, I'm racing the two of the four fillies they're racing tonight, so I feel that uh, they got a good chance, you know, to win 50 uh, bluegrass are here you know so that's the reason i'm here on account of the bluegrass that is the bluegrass he's talking of dr overstreet that had the top horse do run run bluegrass that Philion has driven very often we want to wish you an awful lot of luck in these upcoming races it's sure a pleasure to have you here and thank you for being in the winner's circle with me my pleasure thank you when you look at a racehorse, it's not necessarily what you see that's important. The most valuable quality on the track is quite invisible to the naked eye. Call it courage or gameness or bravery or heart, it's a magic ingredient champions are made of. Today we're going to go up close and personal with a six-year-old gray mare and world record holder in 1994 at Ladbroke at the Meadows, Camerus. Continue towards the three-quarter mark and Camerus quickly takes command, opens up three and a half lengths. The three quarters in one, 23 and four fifths. It's all Camerus now. Camerus with a five length advantage. Would I lie to you along the rail tries to hold on to the second spot. Northern Winds slipping up the inside from third and the outside fancy boots coming up empty tonight. But Camerus is not empty. She's on top by nine. Down the center of the track, her town had for second. It's all Camerus in front. 152 flat. 
While her exploits on the track speak for themselves, her trainer, Mike Pallone, tells us more about the rugged miss. Mike, Cameras isn't the most striking individual to ever grace a racetrack. Describe her for us physically. She's a pretty average looking horse. Uh, if it wasn't for her color, you wouldn't even know who she was. She's one of a few uh, great horses racing here at the Meadows right now. We well, you know she certainly is durable. She's already had 30 starts this year and I believe something like 48 starts last year. That's quite a workload. How does she handle that? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. She's uh, one of a kind. I don't think I've ever had a horse in the last couple years that uh, has been able to answer the bell as many times as she has in the last two years. One would wonder what a typical week in the life of Cameras is like. What's it like? Yeah, if the mare race is on Friday, we like to give her a couple days of just rest in the field. And since it's been hot out lately, we like to leave her in in the day. And as soon as the sun goes down, we turn her out and let her run the fields at night when it's a little cooler. And we bring her in in the mornings. I jog her light. I don't do much with her. I like to get her out in the afternoons or at night. And the only day we keep her in usually is the day before the race after we jog her. We let her in, she gets a good night's rest, and uh, give her a good long walk the day of the race. And I put her on the track at night, I really don't even do much then. I jog her a couple laps and warm her up real nice and light, uh, less equipment on her, and she goes right to the gate, and she pretty much knows exactly what to do by then. Well, you know, uh, she is a world record holder. In fact, last year she set a track and world record right here at Ladbrook at the Meadows of 152. You know what they say, records are made to be broken. Do you think that's one that will last? It's hard to say the way records are falling uh, nowadays. I think uh, when she's sharp, I think she could probably go a little bit faster than that herself. Uh, but for the time being, uh, it's going to be tough for any mare I see right now to beat that record. As far as money earnings, I believe she's earned something over $659,000 in her career. It's uh, pretty much understood that her current connections paid about $100,000 for her. I'm sure that since that time, she's increased in value, but what do you think she's worth today? I've heard a couple different things. Uh, there's the obvious reason she's worth more, uh, being that she's a mare and uh, she could be used as a brood mare in coming years. And uh, with her breeding and uh, her performance on the racetrack, I would say she could be worth twice that right now. Well, speaking of performance on the racetrack, what about it? Is her career to stay on the track and uh, keep going for those records and earning more dough? Or do you think very soon she'll be headed to the breeding shed and become a brood mare and hopefully a mother of future champions? Well, we've talked about this and we've come up with a couple different answers. The uh, first plan we came up with was to breed her first of next year. But uh, the year that she's had this year and, and the, mm -hmm. the amount of mares that are still racing and, and uh, as good as she's been racing, I think uh, we're kind of hitting around about maybe racing another year after this. Would that please you? Oh, of course. You know, if she goes to the broodmare shed, it, it uh, sure is, it would be nice to see her in that kind of life, but it uh, sure is fun racing her every week. Will there ever be a day when that popular refrain from yesterday, the old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be, could describe cameras? Somehow, I don't think this mare will ever be viewed as a has-been. For Pennsylvania Racing Wire to Wire, I'm Trish Shout. Every week on the show with Trackside with Trish, and we're, usually we're talking about harness racing. But Trish, you know your horses all the way around. We're going to talk about the thoroughbreds tonight. At least I do know one end from the other end. Of course, the 122nd <laughs> running of the Kentucky Derby is just around the corner Saturday, May 4th. And oh, what an exciting event. Maybe perhaps a wide open event this year. You know, we got to start doing like when Mike White does the high school picks and everything. We always keep track of everybody's record of how they do. <laughs> Trish kind of sneaks in here every year, never picks the right horse, and we never remind her <laughs> of it. Don't you know the past is history? <laughs> Tomorrow's a mystery. There you <laughs> go. She picked last year, she couldn't remember. We do know, however, that the horse did not win, whoever that might be. I think it was Tabasco Thunder or something like that. Oh, boy. I got a tie with that on, too. Tabasco Cat and Tabasco Thunder. <laughs> what is the rationale for any trainer or owner entering a horse in a 20-horse field? I mean, it, it's just so crowded that, you know, doesn't it harm the race? And, you know, what's the point? A lot of these owners know that they can't win. Actually, they do, but it's such a thrill and something that everybody strives for in the sport. You know, not everything makes sense. Some things are definitely straight from the heart, and I think when it comes to major races like that, people that feel they have a glimmer of hope, just the slightest bit of opportunity, they want to take that chance. And hey, long shots do win. Trish, how much of, a, how much of an effect is there on a horse 
in a race like this where there's 80,000 screaming drunk people in the infield. And I mean, it's a little different than what a lot of these horses have ever experienced before. Can they be affected by the crowd and, and the hubbub that's going on down there? An inexperienced horse uh, could well be affected. However, most of the trainers do their homework and they have them well prepped and ready to face those kind of circumstances. And then just like your major athletes that are able to drown out the noise and concentrate on the business at task, those horses that are under the rider, they're concentrating on that rider and that bit and he's sending the uh, signals and believe me, they're right there. They're not They're not up there in the crowd. Let's talk about the race on Saturday. The favorite gets the 20th post position. I mean, you know, oh. they're in a, he's in another county. Against I mean, the odds, too, because... He's uh, coming from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, and, and, and in doing a little bit of homework, in the last 13, <laughs> a very little bit, in the last 13 races, the favorite, the chalk horse, has only finished in the money three mm -hmm. times. So can we wipe out unbridled? right now and not even bother with it? Well, first of all, on the uh, post position point, only one horse ever went out of post position 20, and that was back, I believe, 1929. It was a gelding, so it was a rare instance indeed. I remember that, actually. And right. You covered that, didn't you? You covered that, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and unbridled song, a lot of people are going to go against him simply because of the problem he's been having with his foot, the bar shoe. You probably heard all about that. He Tell us about heel. what is the bar shoe. I mean, the bar shoe. It's to relieve pressure. They actually, instead of a, you know, a horseshoe normally has an opening, it's now closed, and that fits on the heel of the horse, and it relieves the pressure on the heel so that he will be able to hit that surface without feeling pain, hopefully, and that's the purpose. It's to relieve pressure, but uh, a lot of people would go against him. However, if you're a dosage index handicapper, you would have to love Unbridled Song because he scores high points in all directions for those that follow that kind of handicapping, which started back, I believe, in 1981. Having said all that, uh, <laughs> give us a horse or two that you think really has got a great opportunity to win. I've heard some people say that Unbridled Song, even if all those things come to fruition, is not worth the odds that you have right, to pay. Right, that's true. He's got a lot going against him. Uh, D. Wayne Lucas, a very well-respected trainer that I'm sure everybody in America knows about, has five horses going postward. And uh, to make a short story, Editor's Note is one of them and Prince of Thieves another. Both of those come in with very strong works and both of them are second-time Lasix. So you might want to take a look at the pair of them. That's Editor's Note and Prince of Thieves, excuse me. Editor's Note and Skip Away, I guess, have terrible post positions too. You're going to have a ton of speed or Mm -hmm. Supposedly, this is going from to be last, a speed race. The end of the horse, the end of the uh, post. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to set up to be a speed race, and there's really very few horses that can handle the uh, mile and a quarter distance, and that's where that dosage index comes in because they go by pedigree about endurance horses, and that's where Unbridled Song scored all the big high marks. But of course, uh, there's a index factor; it's 4.0, and really, there's only two horses that exceed that this year that you would have to like throw out, and uh, that's Skip Away for one and Louis Cattoris for another. So they say throw them out. <laughs> we talked at the top of the show. Guy did his story on uh, a lady trainer. More women. We talked about this a couple of years ago. More women are getting involved mm -hmm. in the sport. Um, is there a great opportunity for women to get involved? And is there any opportunity to become an owner, let alone a trainer, or even a high-profile jockey? The opportunity is there, however, it's not an easy one, and it's a tough task even today for the women to get recognition in the sport of horse racing. They are the backbone of the industry when it comes to your grooms, your hot walkers, maybe your exercise girls and that, but when it comes to the training or riding or training and driving, as in my sport, it's a very tough road to hoe. And I, I always found that strange when it comes to the jockey in that it's, it's usually smaller men, guys that want to stay mm -hmm. light, and women naturally are smaller and lighter for the most part. <laughs> Why aren't more of them jockeys? But there's a lot of physical strength involved. Uh, it may not appear so when you see the rider, but there's a lot of shoulder, arm, back, and it's the same with drivers. A lot of physical strength involved in handling that horse, and I think that has a lot to do with it. But uh, as far as are there going to be more and more, I believe so, in the Cynthia Reese in contention, her horse won a very strong race against Unbridled Song in the Wood Memorial, finishing second. I uh, noticed you had in contention circled out all the horses on your sheet. Why is that? Oh, I just did that because of the woman trainer. Oh. Of course, a little. Uh, <laughs> Is that your pick? <laughs> no, no. If I if I was going to go for someone that I think might upset Unbridled Song, which I'm going thinking that he's going to overcome 
post 20 in his uh, bar shoe, but uh, I would take one of Lucas's horses. I think that he realizes that this is a uh, wide open event, no strong horses in it, and he thinks he really has a chance. So I'd go with one of the second time Lasix users, perhaps Prince of Thieves. Okay. Well, you gave us two of Lucas's okay. horses. If either one, Prince no, no, of no, no, I was going <laughs> to see, I was going to give you credit as okay. an entry. If either one wins, we give you credit. <laughs> All right, next year you're going to remind me, right? I will We're remind you. I don't get that. One. Yesterday is history. Next year, huh? <laughs> if, if one of those horses wins, you should remind us. And okay, and who right. do you like? Well, uh, can't be pinned down. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what I'm Let me look at the names here. Oh, um, that's it. Pick a name. I'll take the one that you circle. I like editors now. That's <laughs> there we go. Just because <laughs> I've worked for some editors I didn't care for. That's so why I think about it. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. Always great to Thank have you on. Thank you very much. Can we prove our ignorance once again? <laughs> no, I can't say that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Always. <laughs> you're always welcome. By the way, there's no truth of the rumor that Bar Shoe closes at 2 a.m. <laughs> we'll be back with some more talk about the Derby right after this.